I'm Simon Haynes. Uh, very pleased to see you all. This is our first uh, Ramsey Centre live event for this year. So a warm welcome from me uh, and also on behalf of our chairman, John Howard, who would love to have been here this evening but was unfortunately unable to join us. It's good to see such a great turnout uh, as we return to this beautiful room, which we haven't used for a while. We've been at the Mint just, um, just up the road. Um, do please keep coming this year to our live events and also please keep watching our online talks and conversations as well. Uh, can I just ask before we go any further, are there any, hard to see past the lights, are there any of our wonderful undergraduate or postgraduate scholars here this evening? Terrific, fantastic, wonderful to see you. You are the most important people in the room. Um, keep coming, bring your friends, bring your friends' friends. We, we really want to see, see you coming to these events. Um, and the other thing, uh, as usual, I'd like to start by doing is acknowledging our wonderful benefactor, the late, great Paul Ramsey, without whom nothing that we do, the scholarships at undergraduate and postgraduate level, the university support for the humanities, or any of these events would be possible without him. Yeah. Thank you. I think his, you'll all agree, obviously, his is a truly unique legacy, so we do our best to honour it. So tonight's very special colloquium is, I suppose you could say it's part of a, 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 a string of high-level reflections that we'll be undertaking this year on Western civilization, like a kind of strand through this year's events, some of it live and some of it online. We will be hearing, so forgive me just taking a couple of minutes before we start a, a short promotion for some of the things that will be happening later in the year. We'll be hearing from Professor Rémy Brague uh, at the University of Paris, extremely distinguished French historian of philosophy, uh, one of the great contemporary thinkers about <clears throat> the nature of the West. Uh, you'll be relieved to hear he will be speaking in English, not in French. Um, and he'll be talking about his famous book, Eccentric Cultures, a Theory of Western Civilization. Uh, that will be an online event later on this year. But live in April, we will be hosting Joe Heinrich from Harvard. You might have come across his book, the bestseller called The Weirdest People in the World, How the West Became Psychologically Peculiar and Particularly Prosperous. I would have sensitively rewritten that, uh, that, that title. But uh, that, Joe is a terrific bloke, and WEIRD, by the way, is an acronym, which I will leave it to you to look up. So that'll be a very interesting, uh, in, interesting evening. A slightly different note, you may also enjoy uh, the visit by Peter Bogoshin, who, along with Helen Pluckrose, was a key player in the notorious grievance studies controversy just a few years ago. Uh, and, and, um, and Peter will be with us live next month, putting his own unique spin on the Socratic method. Uh, and then later this year, also live, we'll be hosting Robert Toombs from Cambridge, talking about his History Reclaimed project. Very successful in the UK, pushing back against, in, in his words, false readings of history creating or aggravating divisions, resentments, and even violence in society. And then just a final plug as a sort of, um, what would you call this, a civilizational balancing act. If you, haven't, if you haven't heard Professor John Minford in our online series talking about Chinese civilization just a couple of weeks ago, then all I can say is you really should. It's just a fantastic presentation by John on the four great books of Chinese culture and civilization. So now to this evening uh, and a different format with a most distinguished group of local speakers, an Australian perspective on Western civilization. We're delighted to have all of you with us tonight. Uh, and I, what I thought I'd do is just introduce all of our speakers up front um, before leaving it to our new academic manager, Jack Sexton, to facilitate the conversation between our guests. So hold the applause until after I've introduced all of them. Um, Jack, by the way, is himself, if I can say this without um, embarrassing him, a rising star in the academic realm. 
an alumnus of the world-famous Chicago Committee on Social Thought. He's recently been at the US Studies Center here in Sydney, and he is a scholar of the great Alexis de Tocqueville. So, let me now briefly introduce our three distinguished guests in speaking order. First of all, John Lee. John is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. From 2016 to 2018, I think, John, he was senior advisor to Julie Bishop, the Australian foreign minister. And in this role, he served as the principal advisor on Asia and for economic, strategic, and political affairs in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, John was also appointed the foreign minister's lead advisor on the foreign policy white paper five years ago, the first comprehensive foreign affairs blueprint for Australia for many years, written to guide our external engagement for the next 10 years and beyond. John Lee has held adjunct professorships at the ANU and the University of Sydney. He is one of the foremost experts in the country on the Chinese political economy and on strategic and economic affairs pertaining to the Indo-Pacific. His articles have been published in leading policy and academic journals in the US, in Asia, and Australia. So moving straight along, Paul Kelly, is one of Australia's most distinguished journalists. His work has been praised for its broad and deep grasp of the interrelationships between economic, political, and cultural spheres, and for its ability to place contemporary Australian developments in an international and historical context. Paul, as many of you would know, is editor-at-large on The Australian, and was previously editor-in-chief of the paper. He's covered Australian governments from Gough Whitlam to Scott Morrison. He is a regular television commentator on Sky News. He's the author of nine books, including The End of Certainty on the Politics and Economics of the 1980s. And his recent books include Triumph and Demise on the Rudd-Gillard Era, and the March of Patriots, which offers a reinterpretation of Paul Keating and John Howard in office. And I believe, Paul, we might be able to look forward soon to a forthcoming volume on several more recent administrations. <clears throat> Thirdly, as a former member of parliament and ambassador and company director, Dave Sharma is a strategic thinker and manager with a wealth of high-level experience in national security, in trade, international relations, public policy, and technology and innovation. He is a graduate of the University of Cambridge. He has chaired and worked with a number of publicly listed technology companies, and he was chair of Parliament's Joint Standing Committee on, on Treaties and the Foreign Affairs and Aid Subcommittee. Prior to his election to Parliament, Dave was an Australian ambassador and diplomat serving in Israel, Washington DC, and PNG. He was awarded an Australian Service Medal for his peacekeeping duties in Bougainville. He's frequently published in the Nikkei Asian Review, The Australian, The Sydney Morning Herald, and he appears regularly in the Australian media, including on ABC and Sky News, providing commentary and analysis on global affairs. So please, a warm welcome for all three of our guests. And with that, Jack, it's over to you. Thank you, Simon. The goal this evening is really to get the best out of two different formats, the set-piece lecture and the free-flowing conversation, without the downsides of either. <laughs> no easy task, perhaps, but I think that with the speakers we have, we've got a very good chance. What's going to happen is that each speaker will give a five-minute presentation or lecture, one after the other. We will then discuss the claims made and the questions raised in the lectures for about 30 minutes. And finally, we'll open it up to the audience, the fourth participant in this conversation, and by no means the least, for Q&A. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
My role as moderator this evening is really just to set the ball rolling by posing some of the more obvious questions arising from each presentation. Uh, who knows what might follow after that? To keep it rolling, to keep it rolling from one theme to the next, and to intervene if I feel the panel is in danger of reaching furious agreement. Uh, <laughs> something that happens uh, all too often with panel discussions, but that I don't think will be a problem tonight given the range of opinion and strength of character, if I may say, amongst our panellists. Of course, it's impossible to represent all points of view, and a good conversation requires a certain amount of agreement as well as difference, agreement on the questions at least, if not the answers. But between our three panellists and the audience, again, who will have a chance to pose pointed questions at the end, I think we'll have a reasonable range. The panel discussion will consider three broad themes reflecting the presentations of each speaker. First, John Lee will consider the implications for Australia in particular of the West no longer being as closely associated, not as synonymous with power as it has been very roughly since the first opium war between Britain and China from 1839 to 1842, which demonstrated that the technological and military revolution which took place first in Europe from, again quite roughly, the 17th century, meant that Western powers had no peer competitors but themselves. Next, Paul Kelly will consider the West's internal situation. Again, with an eye to Australia, but also to things that are happening throughout the West and that have been noticed by people across the political and intellectual spectrum, if, naturally, they don't necessarily agree on how bad or how good they are or what to do about them, if anything. These things include increasing scepticism of classical liberalism as an at least relatively neutral foundation for political and civic life, the decline of organised religion and the implications, for this, the implications of this sorry, for the possibility of broadly shared practices and values, and the rise of alternative identities and tribalisms to those historically provided by organised religion and the nation state. And then, last but not least, Dave Sharma will address what I've long thought is a really fascinating as well as important question, which is what hidden or at least publicly neglected resources might the Western tradition hold for an age like this one, marked by the things John and Paul will have talked about with particular reference to ancient Stoicism. Really looking forward to that one. <laughs> Without further ado then, I invite John Lee to kick us off. Strange thing to ask whether Western civilization is in decline or in trouble because uh, from the outside, things actually look pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, if you consider the GDP of the most powerful Western nation, uh, the United States, it's around a quarter of global GDP, which is roughly what it's been for the last few decades. Uh, if you look at the 50 most profitable companies in the world, uh, 35 of them roughly are in the West or are in countries with Western institutions. Uh, if you look at the top 10 most innovative countries in the world by most common measures, all 10 of them are Western nations or countries with Western institutions. And people are clearly voting with their feet. If you look at eight of the top 10 countries uh, that people want to emigrate to, they are all Western countries. And I can assure you that China is not in uh, uh, the, the top 10 uh, of those countries. Uh, moreover, Western civilization has thrived and been preeminent uh, even throughout periods where the West did not dominate in material terms. So, for example, up to 1750, China and India actually had a larger GDP uh, than Europe. Uh, up to the 1950s, China had a larger GDP than uh, uh, a larger GDP than the United States or Europe. Now, at the same time, there is clear unease that the West and Western civilization uh, is declining or at least in trouble. Uh, and I suggest that the problem largely lies within. Uh, let me 
uh, refer to, he's not well known, but there's a British author, soldier, and scholar named John Glubb, who in 1978, he wrote an essay uh, entitled The Fate of Empires and Search for Survival. Now, he believed civilizations and empires uh, went through four broad stages. One, he called, one was the age of pioneers, that is, the material, institutional, ideational uh, foundations of that civilization are being laid. The second is the age of commerce, where the focus is on material advancement and success. The third he called the age of magnificence and affluence, that is, we uh, enjoy the fruits of our civilization without necessarily strengthening or even understanding the foundations uh, which gave rise to our civilizational success. And the fourth is the age of the intellect or the age of the critic, uh, where elites take the light in tearing down dominant belief systems, myths, narratives, uh, and institutions which sustain that civilization. Now, when I observed uh, the uproar amongst many of our elites uh, to the prospect of the Ramsey Center offering scholarships on a study of Western civilization, I couldn't help feel that Glub was uh, onto something. Uh, now, to be clear, there is nothing wrong, in my view, with critical thinking and interrogating our intellectual uh, 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 beliefs, our philosophies, uh, Western philosophy and Western rationality uh, is very much based on that kind of interrogation. I think the problem with many of our Western uh, elites these days is that they do not accept or even acknowledge that they are constructing their own myths, their own narratives, uh, their own histories to further the cause of their group, their tribe, their identity, and refusing to uh, 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 subject their beliefs to interrogation. So you think about the rise in you know, what is now widely called identity politics or single issue politics, whether this be race, gender, sexuality, uh, environmental issues, and so on. Now, these groups seem to build fundamentally anti-liberal tribal foundations based on identity or single issue causes, which basically reduce human beings to that one specific characteristic. It is inherently exclusionary and divisive, and it's the opposite of what a classical liberal civil society is trying to achieve. Now, to be clear about what I'm saying, I don't think there's anything wrong with identifying a group of people, uh, a, a certain identity or tribe of people in one society or civilization who are disadvantaged and seeking to find ways of, of raising up those, uh, that, those groups of people or that tribe to ensure that they have uh, equal opportunities and reward uh, and participation. But that is a very different thing to wanting to permanently entrench special exclusionary rights and privileges for that group of people, uh, which I think is, is happening increasingly today. Uh, the, the tribalism that I speak about, it's also done in an extremely authoritarian manner, uh, rejecting, condemning, tearing down the myths and narratives and histories and virtues of Western civilization and those associated with other tribes without any sense of introspection. Now, those, uh, in, in the view of this sort of tribal view, those who are against your tribe are either considered evil or at best on the wrong side of history. Now, this is one reason for my unease. Many of our elites are at war with Western civilization and civil society, uh, and it is Western civilization and civil society which sustains and enables them to do what they do. And it is unclear where this leads uh, 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 down the track. Now, finally, some words of optimism, because I, I, I'd always try to end in an optimistic way. Uh, I disagree with John Glubb, the scholar I, I mentioned, that the age of the intellect and critic will always lead to civilizational decline, which is what he believed. Critics do play an important role, and some myths and narratives ought to be exposed, uh, as long as they are done within a classical liberal framework. <clears throat> 
So for example, in my view, the social revolutions in the 1960s, as radical as they seem, uh, particularly on race and gender, uh, to me, they sought equality for certain groups of people, not special privileges uh, and the attribution of virtue and vice based on identity. That is an inherently classical uh, pursuit, and in, in my view, that strengthened uh, Western society. Uh, second, the most militant and divisive tribalism, it's occurring, unfortunately, in the Anglo-Saxon world, in English-speaking worlds. Uh, but as we know, the Anglo-Saxon world is not the sum of Western civilization. It is something I've never said before, but there are things we can learn from the Europeans in this respect. Uh, so it is not all uh, pessimistic, I think, for Western civilization. Well, I, I hate to, to, to admit, <laughs> acknowledge anything with the French, but I do think that on these societal issues, the French are, uh, are heading in a more robust manner from a classical liberal mm. point of view unfortunately, than Anglo-Saxons. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, the Western civilization is not doomed. There are just aspects, I think, Anglo-Saxon Western civilization uh, which needs some correction. Yeah. Thanks, John. Paul. Oh, thanks, Jack. I want to thank the Ramsey uh, Center for this event. I want to acknowledge Simon Haynes and Jack Sexton as our presiding compere and my fellow panellists, John Lee and Dave Sharma. Now, given our time constraints, I'm not going to try and define what Western civilization is. Mm. Instead of that, I'm going to engage in some grand simplifications. So my focus will be to argue there are three shadows falling over our civilization in Australia, as well as comparable countries. The first is the erosion of the virtuous society. A civilization, despite its diversity, has been laced together by a shared sense of virtue. And much of this derived from the Christian heritage. As Frank Fukuyama said, the rule of law in Europe was rooted in Christianity. Church law promoted human equality by recognizing the claims of the soul. American founding father John Adams said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. George Washington agreed. The moral foundations of the Western order have drawn heavily upon Christianity, but Christianity is now in decline. It will become a minority creed. Running in parallel, I believe, is the disintegration of shared virtue and trust. Now we disagree on the fundamentals, on how we should live, on how we should die, on what to teach our children, on what is a man, on what is a woman, on our nation's history, and how to treat people of faith. This looks like a moral crisis. The late rabbi Jonathan Sachs said, morality cannot be outsourced because it depends on each of us. When there is no shared morality, there is no society. He puts us on notice. That sounds like a warning for Western civilization. My second proposition is that we are now witness to a crisis of political liberalism the philosophy that helps to reinforce the fabric of Western civilization. Western civilization is more than politics, yet liberalism constitutes a framework that has allowed our civilization to flourish. Many philosophers, from John Locke to Adam Smith, contributed, but liberalism is now under assault from the right and the left. It is assailed for many sins, moral weakness, rampant elitism, massive inequality. Around the world, weak democracies are succumbing to right-wing autocracies. At home, progressive leftists champion identity politics, repudiating the classic liberal notion of equal respect for the individual regardless of age, race, sex or religion. We are witnessing the re-emergence of tribalism. We are regressing. A new politics is coming 
where people demand to be recognised by their tribal characteristics and divide society along these lines. This is part of the new cult of personal autonomy or the rise of a more intense narcissism. Self-expression or being true to oneself is the essence of the new political culture. It constitutes the rejection by the individual of externally imposed moral orders or sets of rules imposed by either church or state. Under the mantra of being true to oneself, one's feelings dominate. Notions of truth, beauty and objective standards are being eroded. The subjective world is gaining leverage over the objective world. Liberalism depends upon people being able to disagree within a framework for living with differences. But as Fukuyama said, expressive individualism is the long run threat to liberalism, democracy in the West, and ultimately to Western civilization. My third point is that technology does drive culture and the digital age is debasing the cultural foundations of our civilization. The digital revolution is the most important economic transformation since the onset of the industrial revolution more than two centuries ago. The digital age changes the way we work, the way we live, and the way we think. It destroys and it creates. It destroys the mass loyalties of the industrial age defined by class, union, company, faith, and nation. Billionaire investor George Soros warned several years ago that big tech was undermining the open society and threatening human integrity. Something very harmful and maybe irreversible is happening to human attention in the digital age, Soros said. Social media companies are inducing people to give up their autonomy. The power to shape people's attention is increasingly concentrated in the hands of a few companies. It takes a real effort to assert and defend what John Stuart Mill called the freedom of the mind. The analysis done by the Professor of Ethical Leadership at New York University, Jonathan Haidt, is the most potent warning of a dangerous future. He said, the rise of social media shreds any shared network of social understandings or meanings. He's also warned there is a real risk to the future of United States democracy sometime over the course of the next 30 years. In summary, I suggest three shadows over Western civilization. The decline of agreement over what is virtue, the erosion of political liberalism, and the digital age revolution that undermines our quest for the good society, all threaten to take us down the pathway towards a dead end. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul, after John's uh, relatively positive opening. Uh, <laughs> that uh, cold shower was just what we needed. Dave. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, to Simon and the Ramsey Centre and Jack for having me this evening and thank you to my esteemed panellists for allowing me to join you and thank you all to the audience for um, partaking in this conversation. I popped into my local bookstore the other day, just earlier this week, to, to browse what was new in fiction and non-fiction and um, I found to my surprise displayed quite prominently and alongside one another Marcus Aurelius's Meditations and Seneca's letters from the Stoic. Of course, they've both been in print for thousands of years. Um, I'm familiar with both books and, in fact, I, I found reading them of some comfort after a bruising election loss. <laughs> um, but neither of these books, those of you who are familiar with them will know, are particularly easy reads. They're not like a, a work of fiction with a plot and a narrative arc to sustain them. They're not really mm. even non-fiction with you know, content and coherence and a thesis at work. They're more like a 
collection of thoughts uh, and reflections or fragments of that. And you know, Seneca's letters in particular can be really quite repetitive and rather dull uh, in lots of places. Um, there's no first-hand account in there from Seneca of his, what would have been a much more gripping tale of his time working at the right hand of uh, the Emperor Nero, for instance. Alas, that's, alas. that's lost to history. Mm -hmm. Instead, you're left with his reflections on diet and exercise and mm -hmm. uh, various regimes like that. So I thought this was a curious choice by the bookstore owner to have these two books displayed so prominently. So I, I located the manager of the bookstore and I said, look, what's, what's going on here? Why have you got these books up here? Mm -hmm. Surely these things aren't bestsellers. And, he told me, he said, no, actually, Stoicism is back in fashion. Um, and he explained to me, I, hadn't, I wasn't aware of this writer, but there's a, a writer called Ryan Holiday that's recently popularised uh, and modernised Stoicism. He's writer of a book called The Daily Stoic, it's, which has since spawned a website, a daily newsletter, a podcast, mm. and a YouTube channel, with all the vast array of digital merchandise that products tend to have accompanying them these days. I'd never heard of this guy Holiday until the bookstore mentioned him, but apparently he's done a little bit what Alain de Botton did for Proust, which was understanding and contextualising uh, an ancient writer or a, a historical writer for modern day concerns and struggles. So you can find, for instance, in Holiday's writings and pod, uh, podcast and website, you, uh, you can find answers drawing on the wisdom of the Stoics for how to cure anxiety, how to find joy, how to beat procrastination, how to gr cope with grief, even how to deal with rude people. So any number of modern ailments, really. So it seems that the Stoics are having a resurgence, and we, of course, here at the Ramsey Centre should be welcoming this. A 2,000-year-old foundation stone of Western civilization being exhumed and examined afresh. But why is this? And I think, to my mind, there are two reasons. Firstly, something Paul touched on, the decline of organised religion and the search for a non-religious ethical framework to guide life and to give it meaning. But secondly, I think, uh, and Paul and John both touched on this, the sort of malaise in the Western world, a loss of faith in the project of the Enlightenment, a loss of faith in the ability of science and reason and indeed of liberal democracy to deliver progress and to improve the condition of humanity. And so in one sense, I'm encouraged by this resurgence of Stoicism because Stoicism ultimately preaches a form of internal self-reliance, what people today would refer to as resilience urging people to accept and absorb the vicissitudes of life. And I think that is a good thing. I think one of the remarkable features of our era is that citizens today, particularly in a secure and advanced nation such as Australia, have come to expect a very high degree of predictability and control over their lives. Famine no longer exists. Natural disasters can be predicted and can be mitigated. Disease is understood and can be treated the risk of arbitrary violence or war cutting one's life short is exceedingly small. Life expectancy has doubled in the past century and continues to grow. And so, to my mind, one of the great achievements of modernity has been to de-risk our daily lives. But that means we've grown accustomed to becoming masters of our own fate and destiny. Um, and as a result, there should be little need for Stoicism as a philosophy or the virtues of humility and submission that organised or established religions tend to preach. But in some senses, at least, I think that achievement of modernity has bred a faith in government, which has replaced it, an expectation that government can and should mitigate against all risks, guard against all dangers, compensate for all losses. It's an appetite for big and overarching government, which I consider not only to be wholly unfeasible, but also one that's at odds with concepts of human freedom and human agency. So to the extent that Stoicism encourages a greater sense of personal responsibility and a degree of perspective about the fact that we will inevitably buffeted, be buffeted by forces beyond our control, I think that's a good thing. But in another respect, I'm also a little worried about this resurgence of Stoicism. 
Because Stoicism flourished in an age when much of the world was incomprehensible, much less within our control. When science was in its infancy, when ignorance was rife, and when any manner and number of unexpected calamities could befall you, your family, your people, your kingdom. And the great achievement of the Enlightenment with its embrace of science, its embrace of reason, its embrace, embrace of liberalism, its embrace of empiricism, the great achievement of that has been to unleash immense progress in the human condition and to drastically improve human lives. And so if people are turning to Stoicism and other somewhat fatalistic creeds, are people losing faith in the ability mm. of humanity to overcome our challenges? So I'm all for a bit more Stoicism in modern day Australia, but I'd also like to see this somewhat fatalistic doctrine sit alongside a renewed faith and a renewed optimism in line with the values of the Enlightenment. And I think one country, Israel, which is a country where I've spent a fair bit of time as the ambassador, does this quite well. And I'll just leave with this, this, this thought. Obviously enough, the ancient world lays very heavily upon the land of Israel. Civilizations flourished, clashed, and all left their mark on Israel, from the Egyptians to the Phoenicians, from the Persians to the Babylonians, from the Greeks to the Romans. The land gave rise to two of the world's great monotheistic religions, Judaism and Christianity, and inspired the third, Islam. And to this day in Israel, people still uphold and practice ancient beliefs, rituals and customs, and the value system of Judaism still underpins much of daily life and gives the nation its identity. But sitting just alongside this, and unlike most of its neighbours in the Middle East, sitting alongside this are a remarkably modern economy, a deep expertise in and respect for science and research, and a high degree of technological innovation geared towards solving today's challenges and dilemmas. And though not without its frictions, this marriage within Israel of the old and the new in Western civilization has something to teach us, to teach us about preserving the best of our civilizational and cultural heritage whilst not shunning modernity, about allowing Stoicism to flourish alongside a renewed faith in the Enlightenment. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> Well, uh, thank you all. We'll now have about 30 minutes of discussion, or as much as we can before Q&A, and we'll try and work our way back through the, the topics covered in a more or less logical fashion. Um, John, I can't help but notice that you slightly subverted our first theme of the uh, strategic decline of the West, or the supposed geopolitical decline of the West, and. Uh, we can come back to that. Uh, but just to kick us off, of course, it's a common view, if not quite as common perhaps as it was before recent actions by the Chinese government or the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that it is only by recognising its changing status and seeking to influence rather than dominate that the West can continue to play a decisive as well as positive geopolitical role. Uh, the Singaporean diplomat and commentator Kishore Mabubani put this view very forcefully, for example, in his recent book, Has the West Lost It? Is this view right? Uh, if so, why? If not, why? And is the end of Western dominance, here we come back to you, John, uh, which has been announced many times in the past, either as new or as real as it has often been assumed to be? Yeah, I've been having this debate with Kishore for probably the last decade. Perfect. One-on-one uh, -on -one and over articles and so on. Um, Kishore sets up a very false straw man that's the United States. And that straw man of the United States is that the United States for decades has been uh, jealously, maliciously looking at China, trying to contain Chinese power. Mm -hmm. Now, when that's just not what has happened. Uh, ever since the United States and the West more generally re-engaged with the People's Republic of China. Uh, they have made great efforts to increase the material power of China. Mm. So it was the United States who encouraged China back into the national system. It was the United States who 
lobbied for the inclusion of China in a world trade organization, for example, in the 2000s, in my view, before its time. The point I'm trying to make was that the West certainly had a deluded view of what would happen as China got richer, that is, they would become more like Japan or Taiwan. But the West certainly, and America in particular, uh, that it was not the United States practice or policy to try to keep the Chinese down. Now, it, look, let's get more recent history. In the last few decades, in what China calls the most benign external environment in the last few hundred years, mm -hmm. it has engaged in the most rapid military buildup in human history, in peacetime human history. It is the only great power in Asia, I don't count Russia as an Asian power, it's the only great power in Asia that wants to revise territorial borders and wants to use force to do so. Now, in that sort of situation, what else can we expect the West led by the United States to do? And I should conclude on this point that it is not the West, but countries such as India, Japan, and a lot of Southeast Asian countries that back in the 1990s were warning the United States mm -hmm. about what would happen when China became more powerful, a warning which was ignored by the United States and the West more broadly. So I think Keyshaw has sort of got his, his cause and effect mixed up. Certainly we're now seeing a more uh, rivalrous period with China, mm -hmm. but uh, that's certainly not because uh, th this is not the result of uh, a, a, a malicious uh, uh, few decades a clinging, by the West. A desperate clinging to power. No, well, the United States in particular has done the exact opposite. Mm. Thoughts on this, uh, Dave and Paul? Uh, well, look, what I'd say is that um, power is always changing. Power is a relative concept. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the United States dominated enormously after World War II, and it was completely unrealistic to think the United States could maintain the political, strategic, and economic dominance that it had during the late 1940s through the 1950s and 60s. So, of course, other powers are going to rise. But what we had, to a certain extent, was we had a global system. We had a global system uh, based on uh, a lot of economic interchange through trade and capital, uh, a system of alliances, an arrangement in terms of the global order which permitted new powers to rise, witness China joining the World Trade Organization and so on. But of course, we've now moved to another chapter in this. We've now moved to a situation in which, essentially because of the rise of China, we're seeing a very, very elemental and brutal power contest. And this is a contest not just about power, it's a contest about values between the United States and China as well. Uh, it just seems to me one of the features about this which bedevils our analysis is we know what's happening in the West, we know what's happening in the United States, and we don't have a great knowledge about what's happening in China. Mm. Democracies are always changing, and democracies by their nature are unstable. Instability does not equate to decline. Democratic instability is part of the fluidity of the system. It's part of the ebb and flow of democracies, and this is what we see in America. America's going through a lot of troubles now. We can't predict exactly what will happen, but we know that in the past, people have predicted American decline on many occasions. If we look at the autocracies, we don't really know what's going on there. Apart from their periodic crises, they're very stable. And it's very easy to, 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 to look at China and make linear predictions about the rise of China and the future power of China, which are more likely than not to be wrong because we be deviled by the sense of stability we see in the autocracies at any given point in time. Uh, stability in the autocracies does not necessarily equate to successful rising power. Dave. Look, just a, a few thoughts. I mean, look, China's rise and emergence as a major power ha has undoubtedly been the geopolitical story of the past mm -hmm. two decades. Um, global power is now more dispersed than it was two or three decades ago. Um, but I don't think this is the important point. The story of the next two decades is not necessarily, and probably is not going to be 
a linear continuation of the past two decades. It's like mm -hmm. the, the fund manager's caveat that past <laughs> performance is no guarantee as to future performance. Um, and I think there's a good argument that China's relative power in the global, global system has peaked or is very close to peaking. Um, if you look at, I mean, just their straight population and demography. China's population is shrinking. The last census showed that. China's working age population has already begun to decline. Most of um, the sort of low hanging fruit of industrialization um, has been reaped in China. The, you know, the, the move of um, low skilled workers into low skilled manufacturing, the, the move of workers from low productivity agricultural and rural and uh, subsistence jobs into the modern economy. Um, China's birth rate is you know, lower than that of Japan and resembling that mm. of um, Italy. I don't know of a, of a power that is rising when its demography is working against it. I don't know, I can't think of a, a story in history when a country whose population is shrinking, um, whose working age population is declining, whose birth rate is, is, is all, you know, well below replacement rate, continues to rise up the global power stakes. Now, mm. doesn't mean we're not in for some global instability and often countries who think their best days might be behind them rather than ahead of them act in a more provocative and aggressive way. Just witness Russia, for instance. But I think we shouldn't necessarily expect that um, the, the loss in relative power of the West since the end of the Second World War, and Paul's right, that was this highly anomalous snapshot to take, the dominance in the United States then. I don't think we necessarily should expect that trend to mm -hmm. continue. Right, well, before we move on to the next theme and to push back slightly, might it be true that for Australia in particular, uh, the shift in, in the global balance of power has very serious implications? So maybe we may feel this shift more than people in countries in other regions. What about that? Look, absolutely. I think, I mean, you know, China's aim is to establish a sphere of influence or hegemony within East Asia first, you know. Um, doesn't seek to dominate Europe, it seeks to have influence mm -hmm. in Europe, but it certainly, to my mind, seeks to dominate or have a veto over decision making within the countries of East Asia, Australia mm -hmm. being a part of that. So, you know, we're at the tip of the spear there mm -hmm. amongst Western countries, other than Japan and South Korea. Right. There's yeah. slightly different situations there, though. John and Paul, final thoughts on this? Well, just on, just on what Australia should do, there's obviously a broader public debate on, on whether Australia should become more independent or, or whatever the case may be. Now, when you have a situation where uh, great power rivalry is becoming worse and mm. the situation is becoming more dangerous, as a middle power country or whatever you want to call us, the worst thing you can do is try to be independent. Because if you do, if you try for neutrality or independence, you'll be bullied by one or both sides, you'll be ignored by one or both sides, you'll be pushed aside by one or both sides. The best thing you can do if you are a country like Australia uh, is to ally yourself with a partner that you trust. And it is our good fortune that we have had a partner that we have mm -hmm. trusted for several decades. It still happens to be the most powerful country uh, uh, um, in, in the system. So, so that's not to say we do everything the United States wants us to do, but if you want to maximise your agency and maximise your sovereignty, uh, what we are doing, and which is what governments of both sides are doing, it is to uh, essentially uh, redouble the emphasis on the existing relationships that you have. All right, and I urge anyone with a particular interest in this topic to watch the lecture that Kim Beasley recently gave for the Ramsey Centre uh, on the implications for Australia defence policy of these shifts. Uh, it's available online. Turning to the issues raised in Paul's speech, and uh, were touched on by you too, John, Many would say that contemporary movements labelled, often pejoratively, as identity politics simply reflect a legitimate desire for justice on the part of historically oppressed groups. On the other hand, progressives as well as conservatives, leftists as well as rightists, uh, as well as thinkers that can't simply be categorised, are strikingly united, or at least seem to be throughout the West, on at least one thing, and this is that something whatever it might be exactly, is badly, deeply wrong. Uh, <laughs> are all these people who agree on nothing else right? <laughs> uh, or is it that we're simply too negative about the West, 
and you touched on this straight out of the gate, John, uh, when measurable progress is still being made in so many areas. Perhaps you could get us going here, Paul. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question, this, this issue about uh, the balance between pessimism and, mm. and optimism, uh, and uh, I wrestle with it all the time. Um, it's, I suppose, when you're analysing things, it's easy to be pessimistic, and mm -hmm. then you're looking at what are the prescriptions that follow from a pessimistic diagnosis. I mean, Australia overall has been doing pretty well in a troubled world, and in particular in a troubled Western world. Um, and there are particular reasons for that, but I think we've got a lot of internal strength and unity, and our compulsory voting democracy is important in this. Um, I get um, frustrated at how, we, how we're going in this country. Then I go overseas, and I visit the United States, and I visit the United Kingdom, and I conclude, well, in relative terms, mm. we're actually not doing too badly. I think that there is a problem, though, about modern progressivism and this sense of identity politics. Of course, the quest for justice is always there and it's always legitimate. Um, and we've, as a society and as a political entity, uh, tried to deliver justice uh, through our political and social systems and our economic systems. But that's always been on the condition that we remain a united country. What's different now are people basically saying they want to be defined by particular characteristics and they want to be separated, they want recognition in terms of administrative law, in terms of um, particular privileges, in terms of economic and social requirements. They want to be uh, distinguished according to these particular characteristics. I think this is, this is a departure from what we've seen. I think it's very divisive, and I think it is, not, it is not a requirement in order to deliver justice. I think John talked about or referred to the civil rights movement of the 1960s, and that was an inclusive movement in which it was justice within an inclusive entity. That's what we should be aiming for, and that's what we're walking away from at the moment. That does concern me. John, as the uh, resident optimist on the panel, a role I've cast you in, uh, <laughs> whether you want it or not, uh, would you agree that it's possible to have continued economic, technical uh, progress at the same time as very serious cultural and moral decline? Well, we certainly do have that. We have continued economic and technological process, mm. uh, progress. The West is still... Um, far ahead of, mm -hmm. of other um, uh, nations on, on, on those sort of aspects. You know, it's, I, I guess it's, it's difficult to, on, on a pessimism optimistic balance, it, it depends what you're comparing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you're comparing Western nations and civilization with other nations, uh, I would be optimistic. And, and as I mentioned, if the West is failing as badly as we say, why does everyone want to move here? And it's not just because we have better welfare states. Right? But there is th what the main concern I have with uh, Western nations, and more broadly, and it's really, as I mentioned, it's really the Anglo-Saxon Western civilizational aspect, our elites. Our elites have a an inherently divisive, uh, or many of our elites have an inherently divisive philosophy. They have a perception or belief or conviction that Western society and Western civilization is fundamentally unjust. Mm -hmm. Now, who knows how sincere they actually are in that belief because they continue to live here. But the problem is that when many of your elites have this perception, mm -hmm. and elite opinion is the opinion that, that gets propagated, where does that lead? I'm not quite sure. So whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic, I can't answer you because I'm not quite sure where mm -hmm. that division between where the elites are and much of society is. I'm not sure where it actually goes, but it is a schism which is getting wider. Mm -hmm. Dave, as the uh, 
resident stoic. <laughs> <laughs> Thoughts on this? I am um, worried about what I see in Australia. I mean, Australian national identity is not... We don't have a blood and soil nationalism. Mm. People um, say Australian, like Germans say they're German or Japanese say they're still, Japanese. Still, yeah, still. Um, so our national identity is tied up with shared civic values, effectively, and, and beliefs. And that's all we've got as a nation that, that holds us together. And whether it's organised religion that has in the past provided that or adherence to a sort of agreed set of norms, basically, <coughs> Uh, liberalism and liberal traditions and institutions. That's at the heart of who we are as a people. And a lot of the effort of some groups within Australia these days seems to be about discrediting, dismantling and demolishing various strands of our national identity. You know, covering our history as a sort of a, a period of, of only shame, um, directly attacking our national institutions, whether it's Australia Day, uh, whether it's the flag, whether it's the anthem, whether it's the constitution, whatever it might be. And I think, you know, if, if these people all had their way, their utopia is Australia just becomes a geographic entity, nothing else. It, doesn't, it's, it ceases to be a nation uh, in the sense that we understand it. And although there are quite ferocious political debates going on in other parts of the Anglosphere, um, and the countries I'm, with which I'm the most familiar, the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, I, I don't get the sense, and perhaps I'm not familiar enough with them, that there's this sort of quite deep attack on the structural underpinnings of those nations. There's, there's you know, a, a claim for disadvantaged groups to be, to be their the historical disadvantage to be addressed. There's claims for historical injustice to be addressed. There's, you know, desires to improve policing or law and order, whatever they might be. But I don't think there's sort of those attacks are hitting at the structural foundations of those nations which are the you know the most similar to our own but here mm -hmm. in Australia I think there's something a little pernicious about the debates we're having that they're really trying to strike at the heart of our national project. Well can I just say I agree very much with what uh, John and Dave have said. I, I, I think we've got a leadership crisis in this country and I'm not just talking about political leadership I'm talking about leadership across the board whether we're talking now about the private sector, the universities, voluntary organisations, the churches I think there's, there's this sense that people are prepared to roll over. They seem to have lost their centre of, of gravity in a moral and an intellectual sense. And I agree completely with Dave. There is an attack on the, on the legitimacy of this country. There's no question. There is a very strong, concerted attack on on the foundations of our legitimacy, um, and it's not being resisted. And too often the, the elites, it seems to me, um, fall in behind this, or they don't know how to respond. They don't seem to have the language or the understanding or the capacity to engage in these debates in an effective way. So in that sense, it seems to me we do have a rather fundamental problem, and I think it's a problem of leadership. Well, there seems to be broad agreement on the panel uh, that there's an attack coming from the Western political class itself, or at least the Australian political class, on the classical liberal heritage and on the legitimacy of national identity. Uh, I'll ask a question provoked by your presentation, Paul, which might generate some disagreement. Does the West need Christianity to continue to be the West in, in a meaningful sense? What I'd say to that is that I don't think the West uh, is going to collapse as Christianity declines. But what the West does need is, I think it needs the Christian heritage. Mm. It, needs, it needs the Christian moral inheritance. And while these things are, are related, I think there is a difference between them. I mean, writing about this, I feel I've got to be careful about saying, well, um, if there's a decline in the proportion of the Australian population that, that accepts Christianity, this is an omen of our doom. Uh, I don't argue that, and I wouldn't argue that. 
But what I would argue is that the Christian heritage has been fundamental in terms of the moral and intellectual underpinnings of our society. And if we lose, if we lose that heritage, then I think we are in a lot of trouble. And what does concern me is I think there is an attack on this heritage because essentially it seems to me that one of the goals of progressive cultural change is to dismantle the foundations, is to dismantle uh, the history, is to, is to attack the history and to undermine um, the, the cultural traditions and moral foundations of the society in terms of moving our country to another set of norms. And I think that is, that is a real problem which needs to be resisted in an effective way. Uh, John, and then I'll come back to you, Dave. If you are an elite, and by definition you, you tend to have influence and you listen to when you're elite, and you believe that the civil institutions and conventions in our country or civilization are fundamentally unjust and oppressive, um, your natural conclusion is, as Paul mentioned, to tear those down. Mm. On your question, do we need Christianity, any society, any nation, any civilization, there has to be some kind of broad agreement about what is virtue, what is the good. Traditionally, that came from Christianity. It may not have to come from Christianity, but if there is no agreement on what is the virtuous and what is the good, and you've got a descent from the collective to one's own particular tribe, mm -hmm. it's difficult to see how a society or civilization can stand in that situation. So that's my answer, that organised religion, uh, it, 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 it sustains society not necessarily because you believed in the Christian God or you didn't, but it allowed a common perception of the virtue and the good, uh, which is crumbling. By the way, anyone who's interested in this question in particular, uh, how and why exactly Christianity has declined in the West, should look at the lecture that Mary Eberstadt gave for the Ramsey Centre late last year like the Kimbezi lecture, it's available online. Uh, Dave, would you like to round us off on this topic? Yeah, look, I, I think yeah. um, Paul and John have, you know, I'm trying not to be in furious agreement, but they've made important points. I think there's a real danger that in our gradual abandonment of organised religion, and there's all sorts of reasons for that, we are discarding the ethical framework that came with it and the shared sense of values and, and, and sense of virtue and, and purpose. Um, and it shouldn't necessarily follow. I mean, you, you, you do not need to believe in the resurrection of Jesus to be culturally a Christian or ethically a Christian, in my view. Um, there might be theologians mm -hmm. who disagree with me. But, I mean, I talked about Israel before. There's several million Jews who um, don't keep kosher, would not keep Shabbat on Saturday, would barely ever go to a synagogue mm -hmm. except for a funeral or something. But their framework is still... Jewish, their cultural framework. Um, and I would tell my children, I mean, my children haven't been baptised, will go to church on Easter Sunday and maybe on Christmas and for funerals and occasions, but I'll say to them, you're culturally a Christian. We observe Christian norms, we're raised in that tradition, um, we go to a church, not a synagogue or a mosque when we have, you know, occasions of mourning or happiness. Um, you should embrace that framework. It doesn't mean you need to believe everything that's in the Bible, it doesn't mean you need to take things literally, but there are important lessons in there and they underpin much of what our civilization is today. And I think um, we're at real risk of, in, in our sort of movement against and attack on, because uh, there's certainly an attack on parts of organized religion in Australia, mm -hmm. there's a sort of broader discrediting of the ethical framework and the sense of moral purpose. It, it, should, it can give individuals in, in leading their lives and making their life choices. Before we go to Q&A and just to bring it back to, to your talk, Dave, is it possible that there's some alternative to either Christianity or cultural Christianity that could play this cementing role in Western Climate society? change. <laughs> Probably. Uh, I mean, a point <laughs> you, you, John, mentioned, <laughs> you, John, noted that um, there's more resistance amongst the elite and amongst intellectuals in France. Um, I would say also in Italy, 
Germany, etc., to uh, what might be labelled the excesses of Anglosphere progressivism. Um, the French philosopher Olivier Waugh recently has recently published a book on what he sees as the catastrophic decline of a common culture amongst the young in particular. And the point he makes is this has happened before. In fact, it's happened many times before mm. throughout history. It's cultural change, which, as Paul noted, is particularly rapid in democracies. But what he thinks is new, or might be new about this, is that the old culture is not really being replaced by anything, or not by anything that really deserves the name mm. culture. So if it's not this cultural Christianity, or Christianity simply, are there any alternatives on the horizon? Dave, Stoicism, or revived Stoicism? Something like that? Could, could that do it? I mean, I think lots of the, you know, look, obviously Christianity took or adopted large elements of Stoicism in its teaching. It's got strong echoes and flavours of it, of course. Um, but there are, I mean, much of ancient philosophy is concerned with the concept of virtue and how to live a purposeful life and what is the meaning of life in ways that find their echoes later in, in organised religion, including Christianity. Um, you know, it might be hard to sort of popularise all of them and refresh all of them. Um, but I think it's, Im it's important that, that we do. Part of our struggle, I suspect, is that in the countries that are probably most susceptible to this, we don't have a recent experience of living under a different regime. Mm -hmm. Totalitarianism uh, or fascism or, you know, in, in Italy or, or um, the sort of the crimping loss of personal freedom and agency that you can experience under a different form of government, you know, just... Um, and that's hence there's a bit more of a tendency to flirt with this sort of demolition and anarchism. Uh, and maybe that's why in, in France and in Italy and other parts of Europe that these memories are more fresh. Mm. Um, mm. They've been Just a little cool. keener to preserve these things. So maybe we need a, you know, a brush with, uh, you know, a closer look at the eyes of, uh, of the enemy or a brush with death or something. A, so a, salutary, from the brink. a salutary shock, <laughs> yeah. it used to be called. Perhaps a last thought on this, maybe from you, Paul, since you've been very strong on this point. Uh, in Australia in particular, uh, a multicultural, modern, multi-ethnic Australia, does it have to be Christianity? Again, I ask. Sorry, does it have to be Christianity? Or cultural Christianity. Yeah, well, I think that um, we, sh we do need a sense of shared cultural values and some broad understanding about what is virtue. I mean, I, I, that was my first point. That was my first proposition. And I think that's... I, I do think that's particularly important. Um, we have a lot of strengths, though. Um, this country is held together remarkably well through a lot of profound crisis during the course of the 20th century, and we have developed a great sense of diversity. We've attracted, you know, millions of people to come to this country. We've absorbed them. Uh, in a remarkably effective way. I think the sense of democracy is deeply entrenched in this country. And if you've got to look at what's been the uniting political philosophy, I think it hasn't been conservatism, it hasn't been Labor Party socialism or social democracy. From the time of the arrival of Europeans, the dominant political philosophy has been liberalism. Um, if you take a line right through the 19th and 20th century. And I think that's been uh, one of our great strengths as well. So all these are reasons to be optimistic. I'm normally an optimistic person, but I do have waves of pessimism for the reasons I talked about before, and I'm particularly concerned about the role of elites in this country at the moment. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we'll give the audience a chance, I think. Uh, now we have two roving microphones. Let me just stand up so I can't see it properly. So perhaps here first, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating speeches from everyone. I wanted to ask a question about freedom of speech and the defense of the freedom of speech. Seems obvious 
in this environment that we can all say that freedom of speech is fundamental to uh, liberal society, to respecting the right of other people to say things that you don't agree with. Uh, Dave, in the case of your government, your communication minister framed legislation which he tabled and which mercifully wasn't passed, which uh, was motivated by the view that there was too much misinformation and disinformation online. And his solution was to appoint uh, or to allow ACMA, the regulatory body, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, to appoint some faceless bureaucrats who would be the arbiters of truth and who would determine what truth could be published online and what couldn't be. Uh, an explanatory paper to this legislation gave an example of uh, lockdowns and said that obviously lockdowns were a good thing, but some people were spreading disinformation to the effect that lockdowns were bad. And this was precisely the sort of information that should be um, targeted by the faceless bureaucrats at ACMA. I would hope that in this audience, everybody would think that's kind of comical because, and yet it was your government and predictably now, since you didn't get around to passing it, Labor has ta tabled almost identical legislation. Um, before you, uh, the rest of you on the panel think I'm letting you off lightly, I didn't notice a heated criticism Perhaps of this. Perhaps if you could just, just come to the question. Okay, sorry. I mean, no, no, the question no, it's, is, it's, it's, it's how is really this be. defensible yeah. in a party that calls itself liberal? And why didn't the media, Paul, uh, criticise this more vocally? In 2012, when the Gillard government, egged on by the Greens, proposed similar sorts of powers for a media regulator, the Australian and, me and most newspapers mm. criticised it. So the question is, how is this compatible with liberal democracy? So m multiple threats to free speech. Sure. Look, mm. I'd, I'd say as a matter of principle, I'm, I'm not in favour of censorship. Uh, I think people deserve to have their reputations protected, so the laws of defamation should operate to allow um, individuals to protect their reputation if they're being vilified socially. I, I mean, I'm not personally in favour of suppressing debate about lockdowns or the effectiveness of vaccines. I think the best, the best antidote for disinformation is more information, uh, if you like. Um, I don't particularly like these terms, misinformation, disinformation, because they've got an Orwellian uh, overtone and they're increasingly used um, by regimes, to, or, or people, not just regimes, um, people to describe any information they um, disagree with or any viewpoint that they disagree with. So um, I, I'm aware of some of the legislation we table. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm familiar with that particular one you mentioned. Um, but I think it's, um, look, as a matter of principle, I think it's um, it should be opposed. The only point I would make is that the big social media platforms do this themselves mm. these days. So they have censorship <coughs> bureaus or whatever you'd like to call them who decide, these people decide which people have their accounts closed or suspended, what information is taken off or on them, um, you know, uh, what's the acceptable bounds of behaviour. And I don't think, I think if anyone's setting those limits, it should be governments which have a uh, legitimacy and a politically accountable to the people. I don't think it should be left to corporations. But in many respects, we have left it to Meta and mm. Facebook and Twitter and everyone else to reach these own decisions because governments haven't wanted to um, touch them. And either um, I don't think that's the right position either. I don't think we can have private corporations regulating speech you know, on platforms that are so important to political discourse today. Can John. I make a quick comment on a principle of free speech? I'm all for free speech as long as there is transparency. I'm all for you saying whatever you want as long as you put your name to it. Mm. Because if you put your name to it, then you've got to protect <coughs> it, defend it. Uh, people, people sort of know where you're coming from. But if you don't put your name to it, then I think it actually undermines free speech because that's where you can sort of muck up the system because that, that system of accountability that you have when you put your name to a viewpoint, when it's not there, that's actually when mischief happens. So you can, you'd solve a lot of problems, and I think the social media companies 
are to blame largely for this. You've solved a lot of problems if you were forced by legislation to put your actual name mm. to opinions that you put out there. Right. Right. Paul? Just quickly, Rebecca. Yeah, I think there are three, uh, three uh, problems here. Feelings, big tech, and politics. Okay, we live in an age where um, we're told what counts is how I feel. I'm not allowed to be offended. Now, once you elevate feelings above reason, then clearly you set yourself up for a situation in which you are going to um, censor people and you are going to infringe on free speech because you've changed the foundation. You've said the test is how individuals feel. So that gets us into terrible trouble. In relation to big tech, this is a threat. This is a threat to our society. It's a threat to our personal autonomy. It's a, it's a threat to our freedom. And governments have got to be much more vigilant in terms of, to take John's point about uh, transparency, but in order to look at the way these companies are operating, there's no doubt this is, this is a threat to our autonomy and our freedom, and governments need to be more vigilant and more proactive about it. Finally, on the politics, I talk about 18C. Well, the coalition government came in with a commitment to reform 18C, and that political battle was comprehensively lost. And the Abbott government had to walk away from that because they were not able to muster, even remotely, the electoral support they needed for that reform. That was a failure of politics. They mishandled it. Whether they could have ever got it up, I don't know. Another question, perhaps from the other side of the, the room. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm trying to see some lights. Thank you. Um, given the um, moral compass role of religion in Australia, and in, I asked the question of Christianity because in a multicultural Australia, surely Christianity is the most multicultural religion, not only in Australia, but in the world. Well, just, just before the panel responds, that reminds me of a remark made by Rami Bragg uh, on French radio recently. Uh, the question for the panel he was appearing on was uh, what future Christianity in France, given the decline of Christianity there too, his response to this was to ask what future France in Christianity, <laughs> given the number of Christians around the world, especially in Africa and South America. Well, I agree with the point. Uh, I mean, I think Christianity is extraordinarily multicultural. Uh, and I think this is one of the great sources of global strength of Christianity, if we're looking at the whole uh, situation across the world. Uh, we can tend to get a little bit pessimistic about what's happening with Christianity here. But there are many parts of the world where Christianity is thriving and expanding. And that testifies to uh, the links between multicultural nature and religion, and in particular, Christianity. Mm. Dave, a uh, response to this? I don't know if I have much of in That's all right. intelligence to add. Yeah. I, just, I guess I'd just make the point, um, you know, we've been talking, it's, it's sort of a related point, we've been talking a lot about um, where some of our elites are leading mm. us in Australia. Yes. Recent waves of migrants to Australia are not represented amongst our elites, mm -hmm. right? That's an obvious point. Uh, you just need to look at them to see that's, that being the case. And recent waves of migrants have all voted with their feet because they've chosen to come to Australia because Australia is what we all know to be true. Australia is a good country, a good place to live, a good place to raise our family. Um, and so I guess to the degree I have, and uh, many of them are Christian, many of them are Muslims, some of them are Jews, many of them are secular, but they've all come to Australia because they believe in our nation and they believe in the national project. And... That, probably more than anything else, gives me optimism because the elites of today are not going to be the elites of tomorrow and the people who are forming the future generations of Australia by and large are pro-Australian <laughs> or not ashamed mm -hmm. to be Australian and I think that's a great source of strength for our nation. More migration. <laughs>
<laughs> just <laughs> to solve the problem of the elites, <laughs> on which there seems to be furious agreement on, <laughs> on that at least. Now, we've got a question toward the back here. It's just hard for me to see, yeah. Yeah, yeah if you could bring that, that's thanks, Naomi. Philip Wood. Uh, I wonder if Western civilization doesn't contain the seeds of its undoing. On the face of it, the whole world wants to migrate to Western countries, particularly the Anglosphere, on a per capita basis. Um, there are higher levels of uh, applying immigrants to the Anglosphere countries than any other countries in the world. Um, and yet, we have the experience of the Ramsey Centre, where it's expounding of the virtues of Western civilization has basically been rejected by our tertiary institutions in su substantial part. This, this, lead, this leads me on to look at the demographic here, which is clearly older people who are very proud of Western civilization. But how has it come to be that a whole generation of younger people have been educated in a way which is highly critical to the point of rejecting Western civilization and all of the virtues that the three speakers have said here today. It is very difficult. Antonio Gramsci said in the 1930s, having lost the political and the economic communist argument, we need to march through the institutions. I'd, I'd appreciate the views of the three panellists as to what a liberal democracy does about its educational institutions that are failing to extol its merits. Well, I'd note that the Ramsey Centre has several partnerships with Australian universities, so it's not all doom and gloom, but um, as an analysis of the general situation, do we think this is fair? John? John should start. He's, yeah. he's um, John's turn, I think. What I would say is that the classical liberalists have largely either vacated or lost the intellectual debates in elite institutions. Mm. You know, I was an undergraduate in the 1990s. Uh, I, amongst other things, I studied philosophy. In the 1990s, we looked at philosophy courses. You know, you had your, your structural Marxism and your you know, constructivism, all that sort of stuff, which is fine. But you, you also had your classical uh, philosophers from ancient Greece, uh, British empiricists, the idealists, and so on. From you, you know, you went through the whole history of ideas. You don't do that now. That's mm. if you look at the courses largely. I may be wrong, uh, but a few years ago, I looked at the sort of course outlines and things. It's not like that anymore. It's it's almost a much more activist mm. uh, curriculum. Um, so that, that's one partial answer to, to your question that I think we've either vacated or lost the intellectual wars in elite institutions, including in universities. It's not all lost, but certainly in universities, any student will tell you, if you want to get a HD, there are certain lines of argument you can't run, right? You can run those lines of argument when you sort of get a permanent job as an academic, perhaps, but, but you, you, there are certain things you just cannot say to do well at institutions. So it's unfortunately, that's, that's a big part of the problem. Paul? Well, I think it's a real difficulty. I mean, in that book he wrote, now several decades ago, Alan Bloom, The Closing of the American Mind, he foreshadowed in that book most of the problems we face today, and that was written, whatever it was, 30 or 35 years ago. So we had plenty of notice about what the problem was. Um, but I think what's very difficult is with this progressive capture of institutions, because the golden rule is, well, the political system is supposed to honour the independence of all sorts of institutions, from the universities to the Reserve Bank uh, to all sorts of other institutions. So. There are all these um, um, sort of um, sometimes defined, sometimes undefined rules in our society which are supposed to keep the politicians 
out of all sorts of institutions. Sometimes that's good, and sometimes I think it's bad. Um, and you've got to go here to the question of accountability. So we are focused enormously on the accountability of the political system, and that's good. But what about the accountability of all sorts of other institutions in our society? What about the accountability of the school system, given the money that's gone into schools and given the simultaneous decline in performance? What about the performance and accountability of the university sector? We don't seem to have much of a discussion about accountability for these other institutions. The focus all the time is accountability of the political system. Mm. So I, I agree with, with the thrust of the question that I think these are uh, pretty significant problems and the uh, solutions are often hard to find. Dave, final thoughts on this? It's a, I mean, Paul and I were talking about this before we started, but you know, the sort of Gramsci's theory of cultural hegemony is alive and well and on display um, in Australia. And, you know, I, so many times I would be asked as an elected representative, you know, what are you doing about the ABC board or mm -hmm. uh, the universities <laughs> or what they're teaching kids in school? I mean, it's a beer moth. There's, there's, there's nothing that, um, frankly speaking, uh, that a government would have the political support or legitimacy to go and do to tackle these institutions to the extent that this, some of their, you know, ideological entrenchment is, 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 is so deep and profound. I, I think, I mean, the only way to, um, we're not going to sort of, I, I don't think, take back those citadels of cultural hegemony or, or the centre ground isn't, but I think what we need to do is put faith in, in people and, and voters and ordinary citizens. Um, because, you know, by and large, I think, um, we've been talking about a sort of a, you know, an, an elite debate, but by and large, I think the common sense and reasonableness of, of ordinary Australians, and especially people who have a stake in our society, so middle-class Australians, property owners, people with children, you know, people in clubs and organisations, the, the sense of common sense and what's perverse and what's not and what's reasonable and what's not is, is quite strong. And um, although we're not seeing much of a sort of a groundswell of reaction to some of these things yet, mm -hmm. my faith is that it will come at some point, that they will push up against a tripwire and the reaction will be um, severe. I mean, even I took some comfort from what's happened in Scotland, a long way away. Um, but with the sort of Nicola Sturgeon basically going far beyond what the public was comfortable with, not on, uh, not on um, independence for Scotland, mm. partly, but on transgender rights and the ability of people to self-select a gender. Um, I thought, oh, well, that's interesting, you know, that's, uh, there's, there's been a popular revolt against something that everyone knew intuitively um, was not something they could support. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, we haven't hit those tripwires here yet in Australia, but I suspect and I hope we will at some point. We have time for just one more question. I think Erica, yeah, if you could, thank you. Hey guys, I have one about the elites that I just wanna run past you. What is the difference? Uh, sorry, I'll go, does liberalism create an elite? If it exists in a meritocratic society, how once an elite is established via a system of rewarding merit, <coughs> does the average person find faith within it? Could you perhaps uh, repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> we, we got part of it, but not all of it. So the, the concept is once an elite is established yes. in a meritocratic system, does everybody else find faith in a liberalist system that rewards meritocracy and an mm. established elite? Yes, so does liberalism undermine its own foundations in a sense? Might be a way of framing that. Um, if, if I'm hearing the question right, mm. tell me I'm not. Um, mm. you know, partly to David Sharma's point that the best defence you can have is that elites change, mm. that societies are quite upwardly mobile for new entrants, you know, in terms of who becomes the elites. Look, it, in my experience, you know, once elites make up their minds, they really change their minds. They really sort of go, sorry, I was wrong five years ago, right? 
the only way you sort of change the elite view is to change that elite. I'm not saying by revolution, mm -hmm. but by natural process of some kind of institutional selection. Mm -hmm. Paul? Well, I think the moral here is that we've got to maintain all the uh, economic and social and cultural levers of mobility mm. because one of the issues we're aware of now, one of the problems of Western democracies now, is that elites are self-perpetuating. And um, we have, this is a reversion to uh, the old system. I mean, I think back, you know, 100, 120 years ago to the fact that Britain was run by three or four hundred families that intermarried and that was very much uh, an elite ruling class. And I think you've got, in a very different way, uh, elements of that problem in the United States today in as much as we don't have the great social mobility in America these days than what we've seen in the past. Australia is a more democratic country and the, the, um, uh, the, the entry barriers to elites in Australia um, are much less strong, fortunately, than what they are in other countries. So we've always had this situation, just look at our prime ministers, for example. Um, a lot of our prime ministers have been able to come from very humble circumstances and end up several decades later as prime minister of the country. Well, this is good. What we've got to do is we've got to maintain the sense of social mobility, and we've got to have a policy infrastructure that allows that to happen, not just in politics, but across the board. Uh, and we've got to work at that. We've got to work at that objective and that ethic to ensure that we maintain that. So one way of putting that pause is that democracy must help liberalism as well as vice versa. Right. Dave, you've got the final word. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think that the, the two components, I think, for the survival or flourishing or preservation of liberal democracy are a thriving middle class and social mobility. Um, and in, in Australia, I think we've thankfully have both still. It's mm -hmm. um, not so true in other parts of the Western world where the middle class has been shrinking or under pressure and um, social mobility has, is, is, has been restricted. But I think that's, that's the key to, you know, a middle class is the biggest, firstly, they're the most prosaic in their concerns. Uh, they're not concerned with some of these elite debates that are practical, but also they're usually the biggest stakeholders in society um, and they bear the brunt of poor government or they benefit from good government in a way that uh, uh, the higher echelons of society are insulated from them. Um, but they're not revolutionary by temperament because um, they've got a stake in society, they see a future for their children, they've got the prospect of social mobility, they don't want to break the system or tear it apart or, or rent it asunder. And I think, um, you know, to me that's still the, the main role of government in Australia uh, writ large, yes, preservation of law and order and national security, but it's um, ensuring a middle class flourishes and ensuring that people can go from nothing to something mm -hmm. within a single generation that's the key to our national success, but also the key to keeping our country on the rails. We're out of time, I'm afraid. Would you all join me in thanking our distinguished panel? It's just, it's just that we heard the clinking of glasses up the back. Um, but uh, those of you who haven't had a chance to ask members of the panel your question, and I know there were quite a few who had, who had questions, do feel free to do so um, afterwards. Um, very quickly, just Philip, just to say to you, uh, we're quite sanguine about the universities at the Ramsey Centre. We now have three wonderful university partnerships uh, with nearly 300 undergraduates enrolled in the three programs. Uh, and nearly 30 staff teaching the programs, and other universities also quite interested in, in running Ramsey programs as well. So maybe the picture isn't quite as bleak as, uh, as, as, as you might think. Um, but that, but <laughs> just thought I, should, thought I should make that point. But that said, goodness, having heard the wonderful discussion,
I was looking at the, the list of speakers that I mentioned earlier on and thinking maybe we should ask them all to kind of wait till the second half of the year and just have three or four more sessions with this fantastic panel. It raised so many topics that we all find fascinating and worth talking about. There's, there's material here for, for several more. So, so can I just say, John Lee, Paul Kelly, Dave Sharma, thank you so much. That's been an absolutely fantastic kickoff to our year. Thank you. <laughs>